From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, welfare reform. Why? Whether it's called income security, <laughs> income maintenance, or equality in incomes, it's all welfare and it's in trouble. Welfare costs us an enormous amount, more than $40 billion a year. It costs more than $3 billion a year just to administer welfare. Critics have said welfare programs just are not doing what they're supposed to. That is, they are not helping the poor. Some say welfare spending should be increased. Others say welfare payments should be drastically cut back. Others say massive welfare reforms are necessary. But is welfare even the right way to go? Are there other ways of caring for those who just can't quite make it in life? In the long run, what are the social consequences of welfare? Welcome to a roundtable discussion presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research and education organization, and by the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Our topic is welfare reform, why? Appearing on our panel are four experts in the field. Wilbur Cohen, Dean of the School of Education at the University of Michigan. Dean Cohen is a former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. He's a social security expert, having helped draft the original law. Barbara Conable, Jr. is a Republican representative from upstate New York. Congressman Conable, in his 11th year in Congress, is a member of the House Budget Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee. Abraham Ribicoff, a Democratic senator from Connecticut. He's a former governor of Connecticut and a former secretary of health, education, and welfare. Paul McAvoy, a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, is currently on leave from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where his field is economics and public policy. Moderating the discussion will be Robert Bork, Solicitor General of the United States. He is an expert on constitutional law and antitrust law. Solicitor General Bork is an AEI adjunct scholar on leave for government service. Now, Mr. Bork. Welcome to another program in the series of public policy forums. This program, jointly presented by the American Enterprise Institute and the Hoover Institution, will consider the issue of welfare reform. The welfare issue appears to have become a permanent feature of the American political landscape. The problem is always with us, and as we become increasingly egalitarian, it seems likely to remain with us. Our dilemma is that we want the poor to have better lives, but we seem also to be unhappy about the results of our attempts to achieve that goal. Federal spending on income security has risen more than $100 million since 1964, when President Johnson called on his countrymen to wage a war on poverty. Yet there are still more than 20 million Americans living below what we officially define as the poverty level. The public perception, whether accurate or not, is that something is very wrong with the welfare system. To begin our discussion of welfare reform, let us go first to Senator Abraham Ribicoff. Senator Ribicoff, as a former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and a member of the Congress, why do you think there is so much criticism of the nation's welfare programs? Well, I think first because politicians from the President of the United States down has found it politically profitable to demagogue against the poor and the blacks. Secondly, uh, it reflects a guilty conscience by the American middle class because of the failures of American society to solve its problems. It should be kept in mind that our welfare bill, some $40 billion, is high. When you consider our gross national product is in the nature of $1 trillion, $400 billion, less than 3% represents the overhead of American society for its failure. I think these are the factors that cause a dissatisfaction and because political leaders really don't have the guts to face up to the problem. Congressman Barbara Conable of New York, you are a senior Republican member of the House Ways and Means Committee. Can you tell us why welfare costs have skyrocketed in recent years? 
Well, it is a very expensive program. The $40 billion the Senator uh, mentioned is only the cost of the three largest programs. That's cash welfare, food stamps, and Medicaid. There are lots of other programs as well, and that's one of the reasons why the cost has gone up quite sharply. There are very severe administrative costs because of an absolute uh, hodgepodge administratively. Uh, the cost has gone up sharply in recent years, primarily because more people, now 29 million, are uh, participating in these major welfare programs uh, because inflation hits the poor the hardest. And uh, of course, since it's a needs program, uh, their needs are going up as the value of the dollar goes down. Thus, uh, obviously, welfare will increase in cost as well. Uh, the, uh, the administrative side is expensive. It costs over $3 billion to administer our welfare programs at this point, and that's 8% of the, of the total cost as well. All these things have combined to, to make it not just a very visible part of our, our uh, government system, as the Senator mentioned, uh, but a very controversial and increasingly expensive part. Dean Wilbur Cohen, your former secretary of HEW, do you think our present Welfare programs an efficient way of helping the poor, or are there better ways? No, there are very uh, materially better ways to uh, benefit the poor. The present system is not only inequitable and inadequate, but it has been built up over the years in a way that has not uh, made it a program that benefits all the poor on an equitable basis. There are better ways of doing it, but all of the other better ways involve more cost and more problems administrative and otherwise, and part of the reason why we don't have a better uh, welfare system or a substitute system is because it is impossible in a country as large as ours to agree on what an adequate standard is between New York and Mississippi and because of the various other factors that are needed to make a decision. But uh, if one were to start to try to develop a better welfare system or a better system to meet the poor, you wouldn't start with the system that we have today. Dr. Paul McAvoy, you're currently serving as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. How well do you think our present welfare programs are meeting their objective of helping the poor? Robert, I'm intimidated by the prestige and seniority of the other members of this panel. As clearly the youngest member of the panel, it's not my position to uh, judge these distinguished gentlemen who all played some role in the development of the existing <laughs> institutions. <laughs> I might add they have done the job very well themselves. The you first three remarks were severely critical of where we now are, so that they are tearing down their own edifice. I would add, however, that, that perhaps I should be in the position of building it up a bit. As I understand, the original intent of these programs was that they were supposed to provide the means by which those who are in no position to help themselves could obtain the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, uh, the minimum of transportation, and uh, other goods and services. The programs have in good part done that, and the criticisms that I could raise as an economist to present operations is that they have exceeded the original intent and have also helped a large number of other individuals who may not very well qualify. If we were to take the amounts of expenditure that Representative Conable mentioned and were to distribute them to those that all of us here would agree meet the original qualifications, then we would provide perhaps 150% of what uh, uh, each of these people would obtain as a minimum level of income. That is, we're spending more than enough to bring every member of the population considered poor above the poverty line. We also have an extensive federal and state bureaucracy administering the program. I had difficulty with my staff all afternoon finding out how much we are spending on these bureaucracies. They are chasing the bureaucracies now, back in the executive office, trying to find out uh, how much is spent on which part of which program. They will be late for the session this evening. Uh, <laughs> when, when I left, they were still, they had well gone over $2 billion of annual outlay. 
for salaries and other operating expenditures for federal, state, and local overlapping uh, programs. It may very well be that we could redesign these. I'm not redesigning them to achieve perfect government any more than I would try to achieve perfect competition. But it seems to me that the, 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 the specificity of the programs, the extreme detail, the, the opportunities for, for legalisms to uh, uh, determine who qualifies and who do not qualify, are a lawyer and a bureaucrat's dream in the present uh, mode. Well, so, I, uh, go ahead. I, I was going to I was going to object to the, uh, the lawyers being to the wrong, to, yes. to the part about we don't use legalism as a pejorative term here this evening. <laughs> You were brought onto this panel to prevent violence from breaking out, not from creating it. I thought you'd bring up your youth again, but I thought I heard... <laughs> I, thought I, uh, I thought I heard a murmuring on my left, Senator Imikoff, during part of this... Uh... Well, part of all of it, I think Barber makes a good point, uh, that uh, the administrative costs, and so does Professor McAvoy, are high. And the reason for that, there are some 1,150 separate administrative agencies throughout the United States uh, administering every conceivable type of welfare program. Makes no rhyme or reason. Uh, I think that uh, the professor, too, uh, makes a good point. Uh, I am convinced that we could take this pot that we spend on welfare and divide it up without any administration and put checks through the computer, and it would save the American taxpayers billions of dollars. I think President Nixon tried to do that to a certain extent with his family assistance program, which was very well conceived, but uh, the Senate, the House did act, the Senate couldn't agree, and we acted the president, twice. you acted twice, the Senate couldn't agree, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman finally did it in. But it doesn't that illustrate the problem? It's very easy to criticize the, the system, which I have done, but it's much more difficult to find the answer to it that everybody will accept. When we talk about welfare reform in any kind of a general situation, one person will go away and say, well, I'm for that because that will reduce the uh, welfare rolls in half. But the fact of the matter is most of the welfare, most of the working poor of the United States are not in the present welfare system except for food stamps. And if you're going to generalize like you did, you're going to end up spending 15 to 25 billion dollars a year more to uh, uh, have a welfare reform program. And that's the very reason why the Nixon program and the other programs for a negative income tax have not been successful in getting through Congress because the solution to the problem is to tr try to find an equitable level for the whole United States with an income disregard that will be a work incentive. And I haven't seen a proposal that will meet all of those that costs less than $15 billion a year more than the present program. Now, is that what the American people mean when well, they talk about welfare reform? Well, I think the problem that you have is, truthfully, there isn't a person in this country that has the answers. Uh, we've lived with it. I've lived with the secretary. I lived with it before that as governor and now as United States senator. I'm convinced that there is no one solution, no one answer. And I think that we ought to realize as a nation that if we're talking about a multi-billion dollar program involving millions of people, before we put into place any particular program, we should pilot it out. And I would like to see some of the different ideas that many people have to take the best of them and spend some money for four or five pilot programs to see if they work. As a matter of fact, one of the tragedies of the President's Family Assistance Program is when it was stalled in the Senate Finance Committee that I had been able to obtain unanimous agreement uh, for the expenditure of $500 million for a four-year experiment in piloting out different programs. Uh, but uh, uh, the secretary of HEW then and the president wanted all or nothing, and they ended up with nothing. And I would hope that when we get to welfare reform again, when some president has the courage to come out for welfare reform, men like Barber and the Ways and Means, myself, and other uh, people who are interested in the problem would try to pilot it out before we commit the country to a $40 billion program. Senator, I understood there was a, I have a different version of what happened in the Family Assistance Plan 
It was my understanding that uh, the uh, Senate Finance Committee was unwilling to accept the standards that were laid down in that plan as too low. And because they couldn't get them, uh, uh, because they couldn't get agreement on a higher level of benefits, um, the whole thing died no, uh, at that point. It wasn't that because the history does play a part. Before it got to that, this was in uh, 1970. You passed it in 1969, early part of 70. We sent you a bill yeah, that provided right. $2,400 for that, a family that of That is right. And then you had uh, the people, the so-called liberals wanted more, the conservatives wanted less or nothing. And then be, to try to break the impasse, I suggested piloting it out. And Senator Long and Senator Williams, all around the Finance Committee table, liberals, conservatives, the middle of the road, agreed unanimously to go up to $500 million to try it out to see if it works. And I thought that was a great idea. But the administration wanted to go for broke, and nothing happened. Then later on, when Secretary Richardson and I had worked out a compromise at 2600 Secretary Richardson couldn't even get in to see President Nixon, and the compromise that we worked out in 1972 collapsed because the Secretary could not even talk to the President of the United States. Well, well, let's, well let's, let's try the future before we uh, yes, replay I think so. <laughs> that well, loss. Uh, well, could, on the future, let me say, I think that problem that the Senator just discussed is still here today. What is the amount that could be agreed on uh, for the entire United States as a minimum? Uh, the uh, the figure on the poverty level for a family of four at the present time on the poverty level is around $5,500. Now, how close to $5,500 as a minimum can you get as a political compromise through Congress at the present time? It obviously, I would say this, and you gentlemen correct me, it would have to be substantially lower than that. Therefore, for many states in the Union, particularly industrial states, that wouldn't satisfy them, and you wouldn't be able to get a compromise that would be acceptable when there are two senators from every one of those states. That's because you're not asking the right question. The, the beginning question is not how do we obtain a certain level of income for everyone below that level for some test period, but how can we help those that are in some way unable to work within the system as it now is constituted. There are large numbers of individuals who have temporarily low incomes. These individuals would be caught up and rewarded in any program where the, the operation of the program sends out checks to everyone below an income level. We're not really after incomes. We're after providing the opportunity to consume of those who have no assets, no wealth, no income, and are unable to generate their own. Oh, well, what income level would you propose? This, this is just the problem. You shouldn't propose a level of income. You should propose a new program which can be so specific as to separate those without income and wealth and any opportunity to earn from those who have low levels of income. All right, I ask you again, my, for people my, who have no income, what level door, would you set? You're avoiding neighbor. the question. You're my, living no, in a dream world, no, sir. No, I am not living in a dream world. Well, what world. specific figure would you propose? I'm living in a world in which my next door neighbor is a medical student who has no income, who would qualify under a check receiving program in this small period before he begins to earn $150,000. Well, I'm perfectly willing to exclude all physicians and medical students ah, because they're going to have a lot of income. Now we have a special program. All right. Now, what income are you going to propose? That's well, there the are lots of other exclusions which you must make, Mr. Cohen, as well. And when you get make down all the exclusions you want, then and we're tell back me to the what is program. the income that we're you would propose. We're back to the present no, program. We're not back no. to the present no, program. Yes, we are. Yeah, we're back to no. 1,100 no. programs. Yeah, see, yes, what, what bothers no. me with Professor, with, with Professor McAvoy, and this has been the tr problem every time you talk for welfare reform, everybody talks of generalities. Now, you're one of the president's economic advisors. Give me a specific program that you would advise President Ford to submit to the Congress of the United States. Mr. Mr. Ribicoff, I have that program in hand. Oh, and let's is, hear it. That is, you, you, keep, you, keep, is, you keep tearing down I, your building, and I keep trying to patch it back together. We're anxious this to is a historic moment, I think. We don't want <laughs> the, the welfare programs which we have in operation now can be improved. They oh. can be made more efficient through the, the, the use of of more advanced government operation techniques, 
through the use of, uh, of uh, uh, computer systems, information systems, uh, through the, the taking out of this program set of 1,100, those that are clearly redundant, that, that you and I would agree on. Can, this can is a structure which we have in place now. The and it differs from Mr. Cohen's structure, on the SSI which program. is to tear it down and start issuing checks. Can we agree on this, gentlemen, that we're not no. likely to achieve the, all right, that we're not likely to achieve the millennium overnight, and that we That's shouldn't right. expect to That's do right. that? and that we should be taking specific concrete steps toward a more rational welfare system through a process of consolidation, cashing out, building a federal floor under the low welfare states so that we'll reduce the disparity between the high and the low welfare states, and so forth. Is, is that, what, what is that a reasonable you, step for Congress? Would, Barbara, would, 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 would you go, would you go for, for national standards and for the federal government assuming the entire welfare we, load and I think here you would start eliminating disparities and eliminating well, the tragedy of New York City, the only city in the United States that has a billion dollars a year tax uh, uh, bill for welfare. If New York City was like practically every other city in the United States did not have to pay its welfare program, uh, it, it would have a surplus. Senator, that's deficit. the point. You can't go for national standards because it's politically unachievable. But what you can do is you can work toward them. No, you could do it you this can, way, You could start building a floor under no. the existing structure. Maybe Barbara, we should you could up. do it regionally. I think the way you do this, there are different standards of uh, income maintenance or standards of living throughout the United States. And you could build standards on a regional basis, certainly. It doesn't cost as much to live in Mississippi as New York City. But New York City, Chicago, the industrial parts of the United States, you can have a standard for that. For the rural area, another standard. The farm states, another standard. The deep South, another standard. And I think we could have national standards built on a regional basis. In other words, what I am arguing for is no set program for this country. It just can't be done. I am arguing for a common sense approach where we pilot out different programs that we try to develop between the legislative and executive branch. Don't spend $40 billion. Let's spend $500 million over a period of three or four years. And those that work, we adopt. Those that don't now, work, let's, we, let's, we slough off. We've had uh, remarks that the, the program is terribly complicated. In fact, it's balkanized. You have 1,150 uh, agencies and so forth, and that must be part of the problem. And what I hear some of you saying, and what I hear Dr. McAvoy saying, is that he doesn't want to go to a check program because that necessarily includes all kinds of people we don't wish to include. But what would be wrong uh, with, a, with coalescing all of these programs, in fact, doing away with programs like Social Security, aid to the disabled, aid to the blind, and simply using a check program? Food stamps. Uh, eliminating a, a large amount of bureaucracy, eliminating a lot of overlap, and I don't see why it has we to be done. We took that step with SSI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We but combined you, but three But you then took programs. another step, Congressman, of once you'd cashed the program out, you started adding benefits started on adding top. Started adding benefits on top. That's correct. And, and that may be the real problem, that the Congressman can't get, keep away well, from adding a few more goodies. Part of the so difficulty there. So then you have there, the cash out, and then you have the goodies too. Part of the difficulty there is Could that happen. everybody wants a piece of the action. You have 11 House committees, 10 Senate committees, and nine executive agencies all participating in welfare. They get into it on a somewhat competitive basis. The minute you cash out, for instance, the food stamp program uh, as, as part of uh, any uh, cash welfare program, you'll find the agricultural co agriculture committees fighting to create a new food stamp program on top of it in order that they may have a piece of that action for the jurisdictional benefits it'll give them in, in uh, getting through their agricultural bills. You mean to say that you're telling the American public tonight that the welfare problem is entirely a jurisdictional problem? I'm not telling, oh, I didn't say it was entirely. <laughs> I, all I'm saying is that that's a very serious, complicating factor, and it is unseemly to see the competition among participating agencies and committees. Could I join my colleagues, though, in agreeing on two points that have been made here? One, I think it is possible to improve the present welfare system without having a millennial program. There, is, there are two things that could be done. One is the working poor are excluded largely from at least the aid in to families states. for dependent children. 
And I believe that has been a very serious difficulty. Uh, we have tried over many years to try to remedy that, but of course, broadening the program to include the working poor uh, represents an increase in cost, and uh, that becomes a difficulty. But I do think that the discriminatory treatment which now exists, where a man or a woman tries to keep the family intact, and except for some states and localities, cannot get on welfare, <coughs> except where the head of the family deserts the family, is a wrong philosophy and ought to be corrected. I think that's number one. Secondly, I do think that the suggestion that you made, Barber, is a good one. We could and it would not prevent having a different system later on to try to minimize the disparity between the states by setting some kind of minimum and raising that over a period of five years so that when we did have an opportunity for welfare reform in a more comprehensive way, the disparities wouldn't be as large as they are today, which I take was one of the major reasons why the Family Assistance Program wasn't able to be enacted. Well, where it's always entertaining to see people mm -hmm. advocating the federalization of welfare when almost, I think, just about half the welfare passed out in the country is passed out through three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. And uh, thus, you'd have to have the federal representatives of 47 states paying a very substantial fiscal dividend to those three states, a politically uh, uh, unlikely condition, well, that's uh, that in limited. order to federalize. Well, Barbara, that's unfair. The problem of welfare is a national problem. It is a national problem where the whole country has an obligation. And if New York is defenseless to have the southern poor blacks and the poor Puerto Ricans come in, why should the people of New York or Connecticut or Massachusetts or Washington suffer the burdens on a statewide basis? Senator, I wish I could agree with you. I agree that that's an unfair condition, but nothing is a national issue that is not recognized as such by the national legislators. And I think it's still unlikely that the rep federal representatives of 47 states will give a major fiscal dividend to the representatives no, of three, uh, no think, matter how equitable their claims. Well, once you eliminate their states and counties from the welfare burden, under those circumstances, they might do it. But don't forget, they too will not have the bill to pay. Well, I understand the problem with the states. At the national level, is there anything to be gained by moving towards a check system, a negative income tax system? or a family assistance program, and at the same time, <clears throat> eliminating the large bureaucracies that give specific programs. I don't think from past experience in the existing programs we've done so well, so much better with the computers than we did with the individualized treatment. And therefore, I would be very skeptical about doing that without adequate attention to the human side of the equation of making it possible for these people to get their checks and their eligibility but, uh, in their community. I understand that, but are there large savings to be gained by the abolition, and I, in this company I hesitate to say it, by the abolition of bureaucracies like yes. HEW yes. and HUD, yes. enough to make it viable to go to a check system? Uh, I, 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 I never thought I'd I disagree with my friend Wilbur on anything that when it comes to welfare. But I think eventually that's where you're going to have to go. I think it makes the most sense. It's the simplest. Uh, and you're going to have to face up to it. Why are people poor? Very simple. They don't have money. It's just as simple as that. And then when you face up to that simple fact, then you'll start trying to understand how do you solve the problem. But when you have all the social workers and all the welfare bureaucracy, they certainly compound the problem. And I think, too, HEW should have been split up a long time ago. I was for that when I was secretary in three departments. It's impossible then for them to handle it. And I think that eventually you're going to have to take the Milton Friedman approach, uh, the negative income tax approach, and eventually you're going to go to it. And Robert, let me provide a somewhat different view. It appears to me people are poor because they have low incomes at present, but might have or possibly will have much higher incomes in the future. Uh, my daughter is in that class, she's 13. Uh, there are people who are poor because they have low incomes and uh, significant wealth. That's my grandfather, he's 68. Uh, there are people who are poor because they have neither income nor wealth, nor do they have earning power. This third class is the ones I think we're after in developing welfare programs. It is not possible at this time, with our information systems, 
to differentiate successfully among those three classes with a check writing program that provides negative income taxes? Well, it sounds like the welfare mess is a mess which cannot be cured. Well, I think the professor's comparisons are so invidious that we're never going to solve the problem if we take his explanations. When he puts his 13-year-old daughter in the category of not having any money against someone without education, without a skill, without a job, without a house, without a clothes, without a piece of bread for their belly, how can you make such a comparison, for heaven's sake? Well, I don't Jones think we're, I don't think, I, I don't that. think, I think Wilbur is wrong, the two professors are wrong. Not I unlikely, mean, I don't, not unlikely. Uh, I, I don't think this country is such That's an ass, I don't think, I don't think this country is such an ass that we can't devise a form or a system to take care of the person who is really poor and hungry and homeless and uneducated against his 13-year-old daughter. That's question. We are doing that, Senator, but we're also taking care of a number more. What I'd like to hear the congressman on is the question of if we went to a program of this sort in which we provided income up to a fairly substantial level, do we have any idea whether the work incentives are so reduced that we're really um, paying for leisure and getting supplied leisure? The problem is our present system gives very little work incentive. But as, it's hard as to, Wilbur's it's hard mentioned, to uh, uh, some people, a large number of people on welfare are absolutely disqualified. Although they have marginal skills, they're disqualified from working because they can get as much or more on welfare as they could if they went to work with their marginal skills. And this is one of the reasons why I think ultimately we've got to work toward the sort of thing the senator is talking about. I don't think we're going to be able to achieve it, perhaps with today's technology, I don't know. We certainly aren't going to be able to achieve it unless we have a plan, unless we start working towards some consolidation of food stamps with a cash program uh, in, in order to reduce the administrative complexity. Now, I don't think you're going to save a lot of money by doing this, and I think you're going to continue to have abuses because uh, in a democracy, uh, uh, everybody is entitled to try to find his own ripoff, apparently. That seems to be what happens. <laughs> but, but I do think that we can constantly improve a system, and it's terribly important that it be conceptually a sound system based on a plan that we're working toward. And the, the problem right now is that we seem to be piecemealing everything. Can I rise to the defense of professors? Uh, <laughs> it's I a losing fight, but... I believe that what uh, Professor McAvoy has said is a very fundamental question. Practically all, uh, every negative income tax proposal that I have seen does not deal with the question of assets. And I believe, and I think what you and I are trying to say, that inevitably the matter of assets would come into play, even though Milton Friedman and everybody else doesn't include that in their plan. Once you include assets in the plan, you're right back to where you are under the present system of the individualized analysis of those assets in relation to the non-income that but a person wouldn't that has. be easier than having 1,100 programs, uh, giving food uh, stamps, giving medicine, well, giving Well, in the law? first place, there aren't 1,100 programs. I was heard that from an expert a, m a moment ago. There are no 1,100 programs in the United no, States. There are 1,150 separate administrative units administrating welfare throughout the United States. Well, haven't there been pilot programs on negative income tax? Yes, haven't there been funded? And what, what have been the results of New Jersey, about... Seattle, Virginia. and a Denver, and a New Jersey set of experiments. Have we... The New Jersey set came first. It was detailed. It's been subject to great controversy in terms of of both the construction of the sample and the well, length of time yeah. that it but took. But do we know anything time. about these administrative well, costs of, of, of dealing with assets and dealing with the young and so forth? No, but we, 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 these programs look centrally at the question of whether there were reduced work incentives as a result of receiving uh, income uh, uh, through a negative income tax. But those yeah, were they, artificial they, programs. Well, I don't think they prove they anything. Better, well, wait, but, no, but I think what the senator and I are proposing before is that not limited be, before programs. Before that, could we find out what the answer to the question of work incentives <laughs> was in these programs, and then we can return has, to the... It uh, has changed over time as the program design met the standards of good work, and the latest of these indicate And the best, presumably. Well, the, the, that sometimes happens. Uh, indicate significant work disincentives from a negative income tax scheme. These are the Seattle and Denver when studies. When you say significant, you mean that if it were applied nationally, we'd have a serious problem of buying leisure from a the population. A large number of individuals with low income would uh, decide 
it in the interim, perhaps for short periods, medium term periods, to not go into the labor market, but rather to stay with a negative income tax. So that's not a panacea and both, in that sense either. Both, both uh, senior male workers as well as, uh, as women uh, with children. Well, I, all I want to say, and this was brought out in our other discussions previously, that those particular experiments were very artificial and unreal, in my opinion, because they were short-term. The people who were in those experiments knew that they were that kind of experiments. What the senator and I are arguing well, I for... Think, I think we should stop on that, because that's true of the New Jersey experiments, yes. but not the Seattle and Denver experiments. Well, the Seattle and Denver are so limited and so small and not necessarily representative of the wide range of other income, racial, family mixes that I would... While I happen to agree with your general observation about the work incentive, I would not take them as the test because what the senator and I are arguing about, or what we're proposing, is that you allow several states on a statewide basis to convert their present programs of aid to families with dependent children, plus the supplemental security income, plus the food stamp program, into a new, let's say, negative income tax program for that state, maybe Delaware, maybe Rhode Island, maybe Arizona, an urban state and a rural state, take the entire program and apply it to a whole state under very varying conditions, and then see if the work incentives at different rates of work incentive will work. I think that's what the senator that's has exactly, in mind. Exactly. I, I don't... Because uh, I, my feeling is social programs in the last 30 years have proven it don't always work out. I mean, everything looks good on paper. <laughs> everything looks good on paper, but when you're dealing with human beings, it's altogether different. And I personally am convinced that I'll never vote for a national social program, multi-billion, involving the entire country, unless it's piloted out first to see if it works before we commit the nation. Our four experts seem agreed, especially the two former HEW secretaries who had to administer the giant federal welfare program. They all agree it's easy to criticize welfare, but it's difficult to find solutions to the problems. Now, in an effort to find some answers by challenging our speakers, we'll call in the experts in our audience who will question the members of our panel. First question, please. Yes, my name is uh, Jim Miller. I'm an assistant director of the Council on Wage and Price Stability. As I, I haven't followed this recently very well, but as I recollect, the New Jersey experiment was planned to be a decisive test of the feasibility and desirability of a negative income tax. Yet I gather from the discussion tonight that the results of this test and those in Denver and Seattle have been inconclusive. I wonder if the panelists might give their views as to why as to the reasons for uh, the failure or the degree to which the uh, experiment has shown a negative income tax not to reach its objectives. My own view is that while the various experiments uh, were useful in indicating some of the problems that are involved, until we have experiments that have large bodies, large numbers of people under realistic conditions of where they will lose their welfare check, knowing that they will go off or go on in terms of a real situation, one cannot deduce from those experiences what the impact on working incentives and secondary workers coming in or out of the labor market will do. Secondly, I believe that you have to experiment with different kinds of work disregards. The one in the present law is basically uh, $30 a month plus one-third. Well, I think we ought to experiment with $40 and 40% and $50 and 50% and, and let's say uh, different amounts to see what impact they have on different levels of assistance. That has not really been done under the existing experiments. Dean Cohen, do you mind, maybe you'll explain what a work disregard is. Well, a work disregard or a work incentive is when an individual on welfare goes to work how much of the work income is subtracted from their welfare check. And uh, under the present situation, uh, two-thirds of that uh, earnings is subtracted, and therefore people think that that is, to some extent, a disincentive to continue to work. And what has been proposed in most of the negative income taxes to have a, t a work incentive or work disregard of 50%. Well, that immediately first costs more money, uh, for people who go out to work, and the 
whether 50% or 40% or 60% is the right figure in relation to different levels of income is not, in my opinion, been ascertained through these particular experiments. So I wholeheartedly support the uh, senator's proposal that what we should do is have experiments that are realistic. By that I mean actual persons on welfare who either go out to work or don't go out to work under different sets of levels of payment and different work incentive provisions and then find out whether uh, to what extent they are possible to put in legislation. I might add that I also favor uh, perhaps having different incentives for different states I would amend the present law, which provides for one work incentive for all 50 states to allow different states to experiment right at the present time with different levels and see if we can learn something. Who has the microphone at this thing? Yes. Stephen Tonser, professor of history at the University of Michigan. Senator Ribicoff and Dean Cohen, you have spoken eloquently as advocates of the poor, if albeit professionally. Uh, and I think the focus of the meeting this evening has been on the poor. What, in your opinion, however, is the impact of these programs on the polity as a whole? Do you see any uh, evidence that uh, they have contributed to the demoralization of the polity and political life in the United States? That indeed, many people in the United States uh, view these programs with hostility and perceive them as political failures. May I say this, Professor? You come from the state of Michigan. The unemployment rate in the state of Michigan is over 12 percent. And if we're talking about a situation of having people work, the people that don't have the skills or the ability, the education, how are they going to get a job and go to work when people who, are, who have the skills and the competence can't get a job. I think you've got a great problem in this country. And this is a compassionate country. If a person is disabled, if a person isn't competent, if a person has to have someone to take care of them, do you throw them into Lake Michigan and forget they exist? What are you going to do with a poor person in Detroit that can't get a job? Mr. Ribicoff, I would remind you of the massive alienation from politicians who have managed to use public welfare as a ploy for political well, agenda. Sir, no, I want to answer that question. Professor, every politician knows that the people that don't vote are the poor and the black. They are not registered. They drift. These people don't vote because they don't care. The people that vote are the middle class that vote in larger numbers. And that is why politicians play up to people like you as against the other poor and the black who don't vote. So politicians don't play to the poor and the black, they play up to men like you. Did you want to say a word, Dean Cohen, before we left this? No. <laughs> I, like, uh, I, li I like that, but I have a volunteer. Uh, uh, Congressman Carnival would like to respond. Well, it's, uh, this, we've been talking about incentives here. The, the top 80% uh, of our economic uh, spectrum is on an incentive system in this country, and the bottom 20% is on a disincentive system to some degree. Um, but I think it's interesting that if we're talking about the kinds of figures that have been bandied about up here, you're going to reduce the incentives for the 80% through increased taxes. Um, uh, thus, uh, um, uh, you may be increasing the incentives for the bottom 20 percent, but you're reducing them for the top 80 percent. And, and I think somehow we have to keep the program under the, uh, an, enough control so that uh, the average uh, American will conceive of it as being economically feasible for him to support. I see. Is there? Yes. I'm Les Lenkowski of the Smith Richardson Foundation. Uh, it seems to me that Senator Ribicoff has touched upon uh, what I would conceive as the main issue of welfare reform in his response to the question of, uh, previously. Uh, in 1960, uh, prior to 1964, as employment roles went up, welfare roles always went down. After 1964, employment roles continued to go up, but welfare roles rose very steeply, reaching about three million families 
about 1971 or 72. Uh, as, as employment worsened after that, welfare rolls stayed pretty much the same. In other words, it seems to me that the history of AFDC suggests that changes in national employment make very little difference uh, on welfare enrollment. Well, there must be a question here. Yeah, well, the, que the question is, uh, have we got a culture of dependency that may indeed be due to the AFDC program? And is your faith that better employment would reduce the roles uh, a valid one in view of past history? Well, I would say, sir, it's a combination. First, when you're talking about AFDC, you are basically talking about women with children. So you've got the problem uh, of making sure that there's some place to put those children if the women are going to work. If a, if a mother has a child of three or four and has to take care of them, it's obvious that she can't work. It's a question of uh, family planning programs. So people, uh, women like that, uh, will have less illegitimate children. This is a factor. It's a factor of a deterioration of a society. And this society does have flaws. And this is part of the flaws. So again, you have the question of what does society do with a mother, 18, 19 years of age, with two or three illegitimate children? What do you do? I mean, this is the great dilemma of a civilized society based upon the Judeo-Christian concept. And this is a great dilemma that we are unwilling to face. And it's easy to talk about those welfare bums, but I'd like to know what you would do with that individual mother, that individual innocent child who didn't ask to be brought into the world. Are you going to let them starve? Are you going to throw them into the gutter or trash heap? This is a great dilemma we face. Is there a question over here? Yes. Yes, my name is Barry Chiswick. I'm on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors. One of the issues that's raised in terms of cashing out the in-kind programs. Perhaps we ought to explain the term cashing out. Oh, converting the food stamp program into dollars and uh, housing, eliminating housing subsidies and giving income in dollars rather than income through housing vouchers. People have talked about converting the programs to cash programs and combining them into a negative income tax. And the discussion of the negative income tax generally hinges around one program, one structure of benefits. And the objections to this are twofold. One is the very large cost that it would involve to cover all families under one structure. And the other is the incentive effects. My question is, since there are different demographic groups, aged, AFDC-type families, intact families, different demographic groups which would respond differently to work incentives, would the panelists consider a negative income tax in which the structure of benefits was tailored to the demographic characteristics of the family? Well, my answer to that question is that's exactly why I'd like to see some experiments done that would uh, perhaps change the work incentive in relation to different demographic as well as different social conditions. I don't think we know the answer to this work incentive uh, provision. Uh, uh, we talk very glibly about work incentive. There have been hundreds and thousands of people on welfare who went to work when it was dollar for dollar offset. Economically, it didn't make sense. The person lost a dollar of, of, of welfare for a dollar of work. And they went to work anyway. Why? Because I think there are other factors in work incentive than strictly an economic one. There was the pride, the incentive, and so on. Now, we don't know what a 30% work incentive, or a 40, or a 45, or a 50, or a 75% would really do under different kinds of economic conditions. And I believe you have a good suggestion. I'd I think the senator and I would like to see how that is worked out in actual practice in different places in the country. I also have the belief that it might vary in different in urban and rural areas. That's Dr. a very, very great, that's a good common sense approach you have, sir. Dr. McAvoy? I was going to just add that Mr. Chiswick's question is brilliant and what one would expect <laughs> from a senior staff member on the Council of Economic Advisors. <laughs> well, what, what I'm curious about, why does an idea like yours 
ever percolate through your bosses up to the president. Well, <laughs> Senator, it just percolated, and 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 I am, and and the machinery is going, and I picture a situation where we design an income tax form, an IRS form, that requires you to check off a certain box depending on your demographic category, whether uh -huh. you're, you're uh, uh, married and, and your husband is at home, or whether he lives down the street, or you haven't seen him for years, and there'd be a whole set of boxes of that nature, and, and that, that would be a, a complication worth having in the IRS form because Depending on the box, you would have a different tax schedule. That's a good idea, too. But then, what's the IRS man going to do? Is he going to find out in any definitive way whether you check the right box well, or whether you just check the box with the lowest tax schedule? You'd have to have an audit system. Or the system highest with negative tax schedule. You'd have to have an audit system with high penalties. So yeah. With high penalties, that. you have to have an audit system with extremely high administrative costs. Somebody Chiswick, how would you do it? Uh, <laughs> can you answer this question? Some, I, uh, I can you, tell you how the IRS would handle it. No, no, wait, 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 wait. That's wait, the way they wait. would do it. Is there a question over here? No, this. My name is uh, Bob Weintraub. I'm with the House Banking and Currency Committee. All of you gentlemen seem to agree that the present system involves a large bureaucracy. It excludes some deserving people, and it includes uh, people with lots of assets and others who may be undeserving. Let's suppose that we were just simply to e extend the present tax system to include a negative income tax in the Friedman Manor. Would you all, if you would, answer for me whether you believe this would, A, involve a smaller or larger bureaucracy, B, exclude more or fewer deserving people, C, include more or fewer undeserving people? And if your answers are smaller, more, or fewer, or two <laughs> of the three, why don't you go for a negative income tax system? I also, if I might, want to well, have one question. To one question to a customer. Uh, okay. <laughs> Frankly, I don't know. And that's why uh, I would like to pilot that out. Uh, I would not ever vote for a negative income tax for the entire country as a substitute for a present welfare system. But I would like to see it tried in a couple of states. And that's... Uh, yeah. I, I would respond, uh, none of the above, uh, the same and uh, uh, more, <clears throat> for the following reasons, <laughs> which will take me 10 minutes per On television, per this, response. This, this program is going to be as comprehensible <laughs> as, an, as an income tax form. <laughs> uh, it, it, it seems that if we were to go to Dr. Weintraub's technique, we would be replacing the HEW divisions that deal with specific programs with an enlarged internal revenue system service uh, whereby checks would be sent out to those who had such low levels of income that under the tax code they would get payments rather than pay taxes. This negative income tax scheme would require a larger bureaucracy and a different kind of surveillance to try to find those who have no income as compared to those who have large incomes and are not paying taxes. I don't know, perhaps this is what Senator Ribikoff was saying, it's, it's very difficult to envision the construction of that new bureaucracy in IRS, but I believe there would be one there and it would be significant, and it would raise the problems that uh, Representative Conable has raised about privacy. Second, we have the matter of whether it covers more deserving people. I believe AFDC and the other programs, Medicaid, uh, food stamps, are covering deserving people fairly well. They're doing a pretty good job. They are also covering substantial parts of the population that might not be covered under a full justification as originally given by these programs. 10% of those that receive food stamps have incomes 
uh, roughly of $10,000 a year or more. With the general scope of an IRS form and an inability to differentiate well on a national tax scheme, I believe more undeserving will receive the negative income tax than now receive welfare. Is there another question over here? This gentleman here. My name is George Merrill on the staff of the Senate Budget Committee. We've, you've all been talking about the little welfare programs such as uh, AFTC and food stamps, but no one has mentioned in this context of overall welfare reform the biggest program of all, which is the Social Security program comprising 20 percent of the federal budget now. Uh, do you think that the Social Security program should be examined in this overall context of welfare reform? My answer is no. Well, that's not what we're talking about in welfare reform. The Social Security program needs to be re-examined and changed very fundamentally, but it has nothing to do primarily with the welfare reform question that we're discussing today. It is, you pose a basic problem, and I give you a political answer, to try to change the Social Security program and lead to revolution. In other words, yes. Senator Ribicoff is not going to lose in New Hampshire in, uh, in the next primary. Robert, <laughs> Robert, won't, the, won't the sunset law terminate the Social Security No, program? but the sunset <laughs> law, the sunset law will, does not apply to any trust fund, pension, Social Security, in which there's a long-term investment I mean, there are in benefit. already escape clauses. Well, that's right. altogether different. How are you well, going, I think how are you going to terminate people who 25 years have paid in the Social Security? With the, with the amendments in the Senate, it'll end out applying to the ICC, I hope. Can we, ha sure we have one more question, I please? Maybe to the IRS. Uh, we can't. <laughs> we all wish that. <laughs> well, this concludes a public policy forum. <laughs> Presented by the American Enterprise Institute and the Hoover Institution, I want to thank our distinguished panelists for a lively discussion. Dr. McAvoy, our youngest. Uh, our brightest. Representative Conable, uh, Senator Ribicoff, and Dean Cohen, and also the experts in the press and our guests in the audience who were kind enough to participate. Thank you. This roundtable discussion of welfare reform has brought you the views of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, and by the Hoover Institution. It is the aim of this panel discussion to clarify issues of the day by presenting many views in the hope that by so doing, those interested in learning about the decision-making process may profit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.